This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. The tales have been told since man first gathered around the fires of prehistory. Tales of the strange and wondrous things hidden in the vast unknown shadows of the world. Tales of creatures divine and beasts demonic, of gods and kings, of myths and monsters. From dark forests to the lands of ice, from desert wastes to the storm-thrashed seas, every corner of the earth has its legends to tell. Stories of heroes and the villains they encounter, of the wilderness and the dangers within, Stories of battles, of love, of order, and of chaos. But what are the roots of these fantastic tales? And why have they endured so long? In this series, we'll explore the history behind these legends and reveal the hidden influences that shaped them. War and disease, religious and social upheaval, the untamable ferocity of the natural world. And above all, the monsters lurking within ourselves. Ivan was alone in the castle. His wife, the fair and fierce princess, had gone to war with her armies. She had left Ivan just one instruction. He was not to climb the tallest turret of the tallest tower. Weeks passed and Ivan grew bored. He remembered his wife's command, but his curiosity conquered all. Ivan climbed the tallest turret of the tallest tower. At the top, he found a chamber, and within, a starving prisoner. Please, water. Ivan was moved by the sight and fetched a cup of water. The prisoner drank it all, but then he suddenly transformed. For the prisoner was none other than the dreaded Koshay the Deathless. You fool, he cried. Now you will never see your wife again. With that, he bounded through the open window and swept like a whirlwind into the sky. And soon, he would have the princess in his grasp. If he was ever to rescue his beloved wife, a long and dangerous adventure lay ahead. Ivan's quest had begun. The story of Ivan and Koshe the Deathless is an old Slavic tale. But all human beings are storytellers. Throughout history and across civilizations, humans have told one another stories. Stories of good and evil, of great deeds and lost causes. Stories of our past, our futures, and who we are now. Stories are a way we explore what it means to be human. We live today in a culture saturated with narrative and story. But in the days before mass media, the internet, film camera, even the printing press, the need for story was no less. When the ability to read and write was given to very few, tales were spread by word of mouth. With each telling, a detail here might change or something there might be forgotten and replaced with something new. And in this process of mutation, these stories became something else. Something not stemming from one mind or one pen, but something instead that was the product of a collective, of a particular people at a particular place and time they became myth.
Myths tell us who we are. We use stories to explain to ourselves why we do things in certain ways. They tell us about the part of ourselves that's emotion, that's not entirely rational. Things can happen in myths on a much grander scale. Emotions are heightened, drama is heightened. Myths tell us an awful lot about our desire for justice, the desire for truth, the desire for different sorts of virtues, and about how and why we go on journeys and what we actually do on the journey in order to return home. It tells us what our values are. It tells us how we treat strangers, how we treat our family, how we worship the gods, what happens if we don't. They are embedded in our cultural psyche, whether we realise it or not. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. History Hit has a brilliant collection of documentaries that cover a wide range of topics. The Knights Templar with Diane Jones reveals the true story behind the legend of the Knights Templar, while Meet the Unbelievers with Sanderson Jones looks at how people who don't have a religion find value, meaning and belonging in their lives. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and Parable fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code PARABLE at checkout. Few myths are more exciting than tales of great heroes and the foes they encounter in their adventures. Such heroic quests are found in tales from cultures across the globe and throughout history. But there are often striking similarities between such stories. The mighty warrior who is all but invulnerable to harm. The witches and wizards who help or hinder. The menacing giants the beguiling temptations, the journeys into dark caves or into the depths of the underworld, all are found in tales from different cultures and different times. But what if there was more to these echoes than mere coincidence? That was the belief of an American mythologist named Joseph Campbell. From an early age, Campbell was obsessed with mythology. As a young man in the 1930s, he spent years examining ancient texts from around the world. It was in this period of intense study that a theory formed in his mind. It was a theory that would make him famous. In the countless stories that he read and analyzed, Campbell thought he spotted something, a pattern. Campbell was trying to make a claim for a sort of universal human nature that can be appealed to by a certain kind of story. He laid out what he thought was the story that's common to all hero myths everywhere in the world. Campbell believed that you could read this kind of mythological quest or the hero's journey throughout all of Western mythology. As he engages with non-Western cultures, he develops this idea further until we get the book, The Hero of a Thousand Faces. The Hero with a Thousand Faces was published in 1949, drawing on the pioneering works of Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung and others. Campbell outlined the recurring stages he had identified in story after story, from culture after culture. He dubbed it the Hero's Journey. The Hero with a Thousand Faces became an unlikely bestseller, with a particular impact on the big screen. George Lucas, the creator of Star Wars, has credited the book with shaping his thoughts about the saga. And Luke's thrilling adventures follow almost every stage laid out by the hero's journey. All hero's journeys begin with the hero at rest in their home culture. So one particular stage is the call to adventure. An outsider figure comes and calls them to adventure, says, come on, Luke, you've got to go do something now and help this girl. 
he embarks on a journey into the unknown, a realm that's usually much more crowded with the supernatural. The hero is tested in these strange surroundings and has to pass various trials in order to continue. Within that realm, he meets various mentors and also various companion figures who become part of a sort of entourage that he travels around with. Typically, he then has a near-death experience type adventure where he plunges down into some kind of abyss. But the hero survives this darkest moment and then achieves perhaps new knowledge or a treasure as a reward. And then he flees, pursued by the enemy from which he arises transformed, capable of fulfilling the quest on which he started out. There's one final test, and that is often a moment of life or death. The hero has to use all the knowledge that he's gained up until this far to come through that and succeed. The end result is a new world, a new status quo that comes into being. The Hero with the Thousand Faces became one of the most influential books in the 20th century. But how did Campbell's ideas apply away from the cinema screen? Does Ivan's battle with Koshe the Deathless fit the model? What about the other great adventures of mythology? Is every hero truly on the same journey? Or is Joseph Campbell's theory just another myth? We begin with Arthur legendary king of the Britons, and the tale of the greatest quest his knights embarked upon, the quest for the Holy Grail. Stories of King Arthur have been told and retold for centuries. The legendary monarch was raised in obscurity far from court, but he proved his birthright by drawing the sword from the stone. And from his castle at Camelot, he went on to rule Britain with wisdom and justice. King Arthur for us is a mythical figure, possibly based on a real life figure from the sixth or eighth century. The very earliest reference to Arthur is in a 7th century Welsh poem. It's quite a fun one, where a great warrior is described and then it adds sort of ruefully, but he wasn't Arthur. It's that he seems just to be known as a warrior. He's not really being referenced as a king. But in the 11th century, a guy called Geoffrey of Monmouth, obviously also from Wales, produces the first really sustained narrative about Arthur and the Round Table. The history of the kings of Britain is a pseudo-historical account of British history, chronicling the lives of its kings over the course of 2,000 years, until the Anglo-Saxons assumed control of much of the island around the 7th century. The problem with the history of Britain is that it's not completely factual. It's a real patchwork of various historical facts, certainly some fiction mixed in, so it's a real melting pot of influences that Geoffrey Monmouth puts into the history of Britain. The Arthur of mythology and the wonderful Towers of Camelot stand very much, I think, for a, a vision of Britain that never existed, but perhaps one that a lot of people wish did exist. It has all the hallmarks of the great epic, boy born in obscurity, magical figures, battles, it has knights, it has romance, it has tragedy as well, of course, and then it has this notion at the end that the king will return. That, I think, is comforting on some level, that in England's great his need, this epic warrior will return. So whatever you think a perfect king is, that's Arthur. What he's become is a British personification of the ideal king. And therefore that varies across different periods because people's idea of what they want from a king and what they want from a leader is historically quite variable. Arthur was a great king. But even great kings sometimes need help. So too would Ivan in his quest to defeat Koshe the Deathless. 
Ivan journeyed on through forests and valleys until one day he came upon a wondrous palace hidden among the trees. As he neared its gates, he was watched from the branch of a lofty oak tree. For this was the home of the Falcon Wizard. Ivan explained his quest to him. The wizard knew of Koshe and the danger Ivan faced. He promised help if ever it was needed. Ivan continued on his quest. In the days that followed, he met an eagle wizard, then a raven wizard too. Both made the same promise to Ivan. He would need all their help to succeed in his quest and rescue the lost princess. Heroes cannot do it all alone. Sometimes they will have to rely on the wisdom and aid of others to triumph. And sometimes these helpers are in disguise, sometimes they possess magical powers, and sometimes they go on to become as famous as the heroes themselves. At King Arthur's side, through many of the stories, is a mysterious figure with magical powers, the wizard known as Merlin. He was the one who planted the sword in the stone, and it was he who brought Arthur from obscurity to claim the British crown. In popular culture today, Merlin is as renowned as Arthur himself. He is the archetypal wizard, the ancestor and inspiration for Gandalf in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and Obi-Wan Kenobi in the Star Wars films. But magical helpers such as Merlin are found throughout myth and legend. Joseph Campbell recognized this. The supernatural aid is usually an older character. Their wisdom and guidance are needed for the adventure ahead. Often, too, they must give the hero the final push necessary to leave the ordinary behind and enter the special world. King Arthur and the wizard Merlin were once thought real historical figures. Over time, such beliefs faded. However, the stories themselves never went away. The development of the legend in the medieval era culminated in 1485. That year saw the publication of Le Mort d'Arthur, the death of Arthur. Eight stories of the king and his knights, compiled from sources in France and in England. Here was the Arthurian legend complete. The author of the book was a man named Sir Thomas Mallory. Historical documentation tells us Thomas Mallory was a thief, a brigand, perhaps even a sexual predator and a rapist, and that ultimately he was incarcerated in Newgate Prison in London. We tend to associate the Mort d'Arthur with chivalry and with a particular interest in the Knights of the Round Table as defenders of women. So at first we might go, well, wait, why would a rapist write that? It's this criminal aspect which has made critics wary of suggesting that this is the Mallory who writes Mort d'Arthur because they see a clear disconnection between his criminal behaviour and a text that seems to be about chivalry. The Arthurian legends may have roots in more ancient folklore, but Mallory's work is distinctly Christian. Religious symbolism saturates the text, and supernatural elements common in earlier versions are all but eliminated. In Mallory's Christian Camelot, there is little room for the wizard Merlin and the pagan magic he represents. Even Arthur himself seems tainted by the association. For the holiest and most famous adventure of Le Mort d'Arthur centers neither on Merlin nor on the king he mentored. Instead, it is the Knights of Camelot who embark on this great adventure, the quest for the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail in most mythologies is the cup Jesus Christ used at the Last Supper in which he consecrated the wine and turned it into his blood. Later in legend, Joseph of Arimathea is supposed to have come along with this same cup and caught the blood from the wound in Christ's side. That cup then will give immortality to those who then drink from it. Of course, immortality not just in the physical sense, but much more in the spiritual sense. It becomes this 
holy relic with this really heightened significance where it becomes something to be possessed at all costs, but something which only a few people can actually approach. The knights were called to adventure in the most direct way. During a dinner at Camelot, the castle shook and a holy light filled the chamber. Then, the grail itself appeared before Arthur and his knights. After the miraculous appearance of the grail at Camelot, the knights Lancelot, Galahad, Percival and Bors set out to retrieve it. Arthur mourned their departure. He knew the quest his knights embarked upon would change them forever, and that the fellowship with Camelot would never be the same. His knights left the ordinary world of the castle behind. Crossing the threshold, they entered the special world of adventure. Ivan had found his captive wife at last, but the demon holding her was too fast. Try as he might, Ivan could never catch them. Koshe the Deathless had a magical steed whose legs outpaced the wind. The exhausted Ivan finally gave up the chase. It was then that Koshe attacked. Ivan was no match for the strength of the giant. Koshe chopped him into pieces bound him in a barrel and pitched him into the sea. Far away, Ivan's wizard friends sensed his plight. They rescued the barrel and put Ivan back together again. He could never outpace Koshe, they said, not without a magical horse, and those could only be found beyond thrice nine lands and a river of fire at the home of the Baba Yaga. His quest was far from over. But at last, he knew how he could save his beloved wife and defeat the demonic giant. For a hero like Ivan to succeed, he must overcome a series of often dangerous tests. Joseph Campbell called this stage the Road of Trials. To hear these perilous, for an audience, exciting encounters challenge the hero who is often aided by magical helpers or thwarted by new enemies. But with every victory and setback, our hero is learning and preparing for greater tests to come. No road of trials was longer or more arduous than that faced by the hero of the ancient Greek epic, the Odyssey. Attributed to an author known only by the name Homer, it tells the story of the journey home of Odysseus after the Trojan War. He had been fighting at Troy with his fellow Greek kings for 10 years. Meanwhile, on his home island of Ithaca, the son he had left behind was growing up without him. Other men were eyeing his empty throne and Penelope, his unaccompanied wife. Odysseus was the king of Ithaca and he was known as being a very important hero during the Trojan War. He was the person who came up with the plot to get inside the walls of Troy with the Trojan horse and was mainly known for his intellectual skill. Odysseus is best described by Homer's opening line on him, the man of many minds, the man with the really rich inventive brain. Odysseus was at war for a decade. Getting home, however, would take just as long. Such an extended journey was not Odysseus' intention, of course. He had planned to sail straight back home across the sea to join his wife and son in Ithaca. But as was often the case in the tales of ancient Greece, the plans of mortal men were at the mercy of unpredictable and often vengeful gods. The 
the Greeks have managed to alienate some very powerful deities by their incessant pursuit of Troy. And as a result of that, they've particularly angered the god Poseidon. And the god Poseidon pretty much ensures that Odysseus and his men aren't going to have a straightforward journey back to Ithaca. One of the people he met on his journey was the Cyclops Polyphemus. And this is where the trouble starts. He and his men are captured by the Cyclops, who's a big, scary giant with one eye in the middle of his forehead. He starts eating Odysseus's men one by one and eventually lets them go by mistake because Odysseus tricks him. But then it turns out that the Cyclops is the son of Poseidon. Poseidon essentially is very offended at the outrage that's been done to his son and dogs Odysseus' steps all the way home. Odysseus' journey became a lot more difficult. On his road of trials, he encountered hideous monsters, ravenous cannibals, a deceitful witch, together with all the wild and strange furies of the sea, among them, of course, the beguiling but deadly sirens. These mysterious creatures lived in a meadow on a tiny island. Singing out to the ships that passed, they lured countless men to their shores, never to leave again. Odysseus knew all this, but wanted to hear their song all the same. He ordered his men to stop up their ears with wax and tie him to the mast. No matter how he pleaded, the men were not to release him, and they were not to stop rowing. Homer doesn't tell us what the sirens look like. There's no physical description in Homer at all, until you hit some point in the medieval period, where suddenly, you start getting many more illustrations of sirens as half woman, half fish. When we think about how it is to live a life that's dominated by the ocean and by voyaging and by the physical apprehension of just how alien the ocean is, we want to put some flesh on that to tell a story about that, to tell a story about our fear and our longing. And to do that, we create something that's part ocean and part us, and that's the mermaid. Mermaids date back to the Assyrian cultures of 1000 BC, but are common to folklore around the world. They are usually depicted as young and beautiful. However much like the sea itself, mermaids can help or hinder. The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen is a story of the kinder sort. Published in 1836, the book tells of a young mermaid who saves a human prince from drowning, falling in love. She trades her beautiful voice to a sea witch for a potion which transforms her into a human. But winning the prince's heart proves far from easy. Anderson's kind heroine is unlike many other mermaids, however. In British folklore, the creatures brought bad luck and were said to taunt sailors in doomed ships. Slavic mermaids were also dangerous. They were called Rizalkas and were the spirits of the unhappy dead. Beautiful and damned, they lured young men into the waters to drown beside them. Worth remembering at this point that hardly anyone could swim in the pre-industrial world. Therefore, all cultures produce this phenomenon of terrifying emanations that represent death at sea. People tend to imagine sailors loving the sea. Actually, they don't, and all the folklore shows they don't. They distrust it, and they find it terrifying and unpredictable and scary. This is way before we've got electronic navigation. This is in the early days of shipfaring, where you have to stay close to the shore because if you get too far out, you're in trouble. It's well worth remembering how horribly physically impossible long voyages were in the past. So if you were at sea for more than three or four weeks, scurvy would have started to set in. And scurvy affects your mental processes. It makes you hallucinate, makes you see things that aren't there, makes you interpret what you see in frightening hallucinogenic type terms.
Could these hallucinations be the cause of such visions of sirens and mermaids? We will never know for sure. Odysseus sailed on unharmed from his encounter with the sirens, but they were far from the only female threat he faced on his journey home. To reach his wife Penelope, Odysseus had to outfox the witch Circe, who had transformed his men into pigs, and he had to flee imprisonment by the nymph Calypso, who desired him for her husband. The threat from a lot of the female antagonists that Odysseus encounters is they set up rival places to dwell. The fact it takes him so long to wrench himself away from Circe, the fact he has to endure staying with Calypso, all reinforces just how much that nostos, that return home, is so important. Of course, Penelope is being constantly hounded by different suitors at the court. So I think there's a mirroring effect there, is that when Odysseus is moving through his journey, of course, he's then got to also be assailed by these various women. One thing that scholars have said about the Song of the Sirens is that the language that's used and the way it's phrased in the original Greek feels much more like it's been a passage taken out of the Iliad, that in a way the sirens are actually trying to call Odysseus back into the previous poem, <laughs> into being a previous sort of hero, the sort of hero of the battlefield, and that part of his temptation is to go back to that form of heroism which, now the Trojan War has ended, there's no place for anymore. Once a hero such as Odysseus has negotiated the trials, seen off temptations, and survived it all, he is ready for one final ordeal. The object of the quest is within reach. One more challenge lies ahead. The greatest he must endure. Hungry and faint, he walked on and on. Until at last, Ivan came to the house. Twelve poles stood in a circle around it. On all but one was stuck a human head. This was the home of the Baba Yaga. You've come for my horses, said the old woman. Well, you can take one if you're fast enough. I'll give you three days to find them. Fail, though, and I'll put your head on a spike. Ivan had no choice. The Baba Yaga's mares, however, were just as fast as promised. They hid from Ivan in every corner of the woods. It was only with the help of friends made and lessons learned on his quest that Ivan succeeded. At the end of the three days, he left the enraged Baba Yaga on the back of a new steed. Ivan willed the magical creature on towards a reunion with the princess and a final confrontation with Koshe the Deathless. The ordeal is the greatest test of the hero. The risk of failure or even death hangs over them. Ivan survives the ordeal and is rewarded, but in other tales, the hero must slay a minotaur, journey to the underworld, or as in the Icelandic saga of the Volsungs, survive an encounter with a great and terrible dragon. The Volsunga saga dates back over a thousand years. It tells of the rise and fall of the ill-fated Volsung clan, their encounters with the gods, and their triumphs and defeats in love and battle. Volsung saga began as a series of separate tales that told individual high-born families of their associations with a heroic past. The earliest evidence for the saga are from the 7th and 8th century. We know these stories are being told even around the year 1000 because there are runestones in Sweden. 
The culture of the states that produced Volsung Saga, it's a culture of warriors, it's a culture of voyagers, it's a culture that hugely privileges male adventurousness and male willingness to take enormous risks, and therefore it produces a hero that's also very extreme. This hero was Sigurd. His father had been killed in a battle with the god Odin, so the young Sigurd was raised by a dwarf master blacksmith named Regin. Sigurd is someone that medieval audience could aspire to be like in terms of his humility and his wisdom. He is one of those figures that, like many heroes, connects the gods with the human. But he comes also to represent, very importantly, not only the interface between humans and the gods, but also the interface between human beings and wild nature. As he evolves, he becomes more and more about being a kind of wild man, what would a man be like if he wasn't ever civilized, if he wasn't ever subject to being taught and brought up and taught codes of manners. The villain facing Sigurd in the Volsunga saga is a creature named Fafnir. Fafnir was the brother of the dwarf Brigin, but his lust for gold corrupted him. He murdered his father and stole the family treasure. Obsessively guarding this vast trove deep in the mountains, over time he transformed into a dragon. Dragons are found in stories across the world, from ancient texts of Greece and China to the epics of Persia and later tales of Christianity. But every culture's dragon is different. The Germanic dragon seems to be particularly into treasure. And I think this is an association with the quintessential idea of the good ruler. The best thing a lord can be is generous. So if you want to do a good epithet for a good lord, you call him a ring giver. Obviously, the dragon represents the exact opposite of that. He's keeping all the treasure for himself. Fafnir can be seen to represent um, the worst aspects of greed. He hoards this treasure in a way that it can't be used by anyone. It can't be put to use by a good ruler who would share it among his men and ensure that society functioned well. Sigurd is sent to kill the dragon Fafnir by his foster father, Regin. Near the dragon's lair, Sigurd finds a great trench carved in the earth. For every day, Fafnir is leaving his treasure and slithering down to the river to drink. Sigurd digs a hole in this trench and waits for the dragon. As Fafnir passes above, Sigurd thrusts his sword up into the serpent's belly. Fafnir is defeated, but it is not the treasure alone that Sigurd wins. He tastes some of the dragon's blood, and as soon as the dragon's blood touches his tongue, he can understand the speech of birds. That really just brings to the fore the way that Sigurd is destined to be a part of the wild. It enables him to live in the wild as if it were his society. The reward quickly proves useful. Birds are chattering in the trees above. Sigurd soon realizes that they're talking about him. His foster father, Regin, the birds say, is plotting to betray Sigurd. His adventure is not over yet. Sigurd's story and the Falsunga saga do not end with the defeat of Fafnir, nor does the hero's journey. Once the object of one's quest has been achieved, there is the return home. And coming back can be as adventurous and as dangerous and as thrilling as setting out in the first place. Ivan and the princess raced away from Koshe. The demon, however, was close on their heels. 
But Ivan would not be defeated this time. Just as Koshe was closing in, Ivan swung his club high and hard. Koshe the Deathless was dead. Ivan's quest was at an end. His beloved wife was safe at last. The giant's body burned on a pyre. As Koshe's ashes scattered to the winds, Ivan and his princess returned on their magical steed to the castle in the woods. There they ruled in peace and happiness forevermore. Successful in returning from the special world, our hero returns not only with the object of his quest, but with the newfound wisdom and self-knowledge required to build a better life. A new status quo is born in the ordinary world. And so the hero's journey comes to an end. Several decades have passed since Campbell first outlined his theory. Storytellers from Hollywood and beyond continue to be inspired by it. And it's helped shape modern thinking about the origin of myth. But Campbell is not without his critics. Scholars continue to debate the merits of his theory. And there are many other lenses through which to examine mythology's roots and meaning. All these mythologies were developed by societies for a really wide variety of different purposes, other than simple entertainment. They were often developed to teach people very complex moral lessons about being members of particular cultures. When we're thinking about myths, we do have to look at the particular culture that they've grown out of, because they do tell us something about the nationalistic background or the cultural background of these particular indigenous peoples. If you look underneath and pay attention to the cultures themselves and start looking at the context in the broader world they live in, they're just far more interesting. The idea of a common humanity reflected in the hero's journey remains an attractive one in an often divided world. But as this series will show, the realm of myths and monsters is far too strange and fascinating for one model to contain. In the long history of humanity and in the deep recesses of our collective imaginations, there are far more stories for us to explore. Stories of magic and wonder, of love and betrayal, of sacrifice and cruelty. The world we know and the great mysteries that lie beyond. The tales have been told since man first gathered around the fires of prehistory. Tales of the strange and wondrous things hidden in the vast unknown shadows of the world. Tales of creatures divine and beasts demonic, of gods and kings, of myths and monsters. From dark forests to the lands of ice, from desert wastes to the storm-thrashed seas, every corner of the earth has its legends to tell. Stories of heroes and the villains they encounter, of the wilderness and the dangers within. Stories of battles, of love, of order, and of chaos. But what are the roots of these fantastic tales? And why have they endured so long? In this series, we'll explore the history behind these legends and reveal the hidden influences that shaped them. War and disease, religious and social upheaval, the untamable ferocity of the natural world. And above all, the monsters lurking within ourselves.
For most of our existence on Earth, humans were hunter-gatherers. We foraged for survival, living on what we could scavenge, always on the move. All this changed around 10,000 years ago, when mankind formed its first permanent settlements, when we started growing crops and domesticating animals. The agricultural revolution had begun. The settlements grew, towns formed, then cities, nations and empires. But it took more than living side by side to form a community. Shared traditions and beliefs were needed, and shared stories. It's through stories that the boundaries of a community were set, that their rules were tested, that they coped with change. All society is going through periods of rapid change, desperately need myths to hang on to. Sometimes myths seem to exist to question social norms and to ask us to question them. That's a much better way of enforcing social norms than the kind of story which just says, this is the social norm, this is what you're going to do. I think if one sees it as a kind of vehicle in narrative form for things which are important in society, that's probably the best way of thinking of it. So a lot of myths involve characters, heroes, heroines, debating what they should do, and in that way, a norm gets defined. Myths, of course, can only become myths if we share them. We're a community of readers of the Bible. We share the faith in those stories. So myths create community. They bond us together. Societies exist in a state of tension. The needs and wants of all can never be satisfied at the same time. A balance must be found. It's in the stories we tell each other that we debate what that balance is. The laws of the kingdom were clear. And Prince Roswell had broken them. He had disobeyed his father, the king. The three noblemen had been in the dungeon for years. They were blamed by the king for a crime they did not commit. Roswell was not his father, however. The injustice done to the three men shamed him. He had to do something. Roswell led the nobles out of the dungeon, past the guards, and through the secret, silent passages of the castle to freedom. But Roswell's father soon discovered who was responsible for the prisoner's escape. Roswell would pay a price for its kindness. The king banished his son, sending him forever into exile. The law, after all, was the law. It is a comforting thought that we have control over our destiny. The random cruelty of the world can seem at times too much to bear. Stories offer a haven. Good is rewarded, evil punished, and everyone gets their just deserts. In a story, even catastrophe has a reason. The rivers of central Germany carve through field and hill on their journey to the distant sea. For centuries, these waterways have borne goods and people up and down the country. Riverside towns grew rich on the back of this trade. One of those settlements was the town of Hamlin. Hamlin was an important center for the shipping of grain. It was on the Visa River. It got lots of grain coming in, it milled it, and it shipped it out. So it was one of the relatively new towns which were becoming very, very important. Much like 
all German towns of that age. It would have had a social structure. It would have had a class of Bürger, what we would call bourgeoisie, that is to say, qualified citizens of the, of the town. It would have been dominated by guilds rather than aristocrats. So one would begin to see the sort of structure that would eventually evolve into the modern city. Hamlin is most famous, however, for the story of the Pied Piper. It's one of the best known tales of the Brothers Grimm. In their telling, Hamlin was wealthy and thriving. Its citizens lived happily in their fine grey stone houses until an infestation of rats inflicted misery on the town. This black swarm of vermin attacked barns and storehouses. They gnawed on wood and chewed through cloth. Try as they might, the people could not rid themselves of the plague. Salvation seemed to come in the figure of a mysterious piper. He lured the rats into the river with a magical song. But when the town refused to pay him what was promised, the piper swore revenge. Returning to the town, he played his song once more. But this time, it was the town's children he entranced. He marched them out of Hamelin and into a mountain cave. Neither piper nor children were ever seen again. There's more to it, however, than mere legend. In 1384, the Hamlin Chronicle recorded that a century had passed since the children had left the town. Something did happen in Hamlin, but what? Because there's a specific date, there's a suggestion that, well, maybe this started as a real story. And then you get the kind of speculation of what is going on. I think we can say deductively, well, in all probability, it will have had its origin in some kind of social and cultural crisis. That's what the stories are there for. They're there to resolve that crisis. What kind of crisis might that have been? Well, we, we don't know. We can speculate. Some suggest that a disease or famine must have struck Hamelin. The piper was symbolic of the death which carried the town's children away. Others have linked the story to the dancing plagues of medieval Europe. This bizarre trend saw thousands of people dance together in a state of frenzy until collapsing from exhaustion. A more convincing theory is that the legend of the Pied Piper is a story of migration. The town's children were in fact citizens who left Hamlin en masse in the late 13th century. This was a time when recruiters traveled across Central Europe seeking settlers for land further east. They offered rewards for those willing to move. Thousands took up the offer. Eastern Europe, you had these huge empty tracts of land, and landowners would actually hire agents to go find people to come and farm the land. So this may actually be a story of immigration. There are some names which contain the etymology of Hamlin, and it is possible that perhaps 100 or 150 of the youth of Harmon wandered away, and that the tale, therefore, has its origins in that great division of the population. The Grimms recorded their version of the story in the 1800s. But the tale had been told and retold in Europe since the Middle Ages, and it evolved along the way. Once you get people living in cities and they're crowded, you begin to see a change in the kind of stories they tell themselves or they tell each other. There are no rats in the original story. The idea of the bargain comes in even slightly later. And then by the time the 19th century comes along, you begin to get a much more sentimental thing, the little lame boy or the little blind boy, depending on the version, who can't keep up with his fellows. And therefore, you know, the mountain closes before he can get there. So it's a wonderful example of how myths will change as society changes. The story of the Pied Piper 
is one of social norms broken. Hamelin loses its children, not to the random cruelty of sickness or war, but because of his own people's actions. They broke their agreement with the Piper. Their greed and dishonesty are responsible for the disappearance of the children. In times scarred by war, starvation and disease, the sense of control, the story implies, must have been comforting. Avoid Hamlin's mistake, obey the rules of society, and catastrophe can be prevented. Prince Roswald did not go into his exile alone. He was accompanied by a steward who had served the family loyally for many years. After a long ride through punishing terrain, Roswald suggested they rest a while at a cooling stream. A sharp blow sent Roswald crashing unconscious to the ground. The steward sneered over him. Long had this man nursed resentment for his masters. Long had he cloaked his ambitions. Roswell's parents had given him gold enough to live in princely fashion. The wicked steward took it all. Donning Roswell's fine garments, the steward rode away with a prince's fortune and a prince's name. Poor Roswell was left for dead. Not all lawbreakers are as unpleasant as Roswell's treacherous steward. The good thief is an archetype found in cultures around the world. This rogue may break the laws of the land, but only to follow a higher code. In rebelling against the existing social order with all its flaws and inequalities, the good thief holds out the promise of something better. Amid the trees and woodland streams of the English forest, there once lurked a fugitive from the law. He was known by kings in their castles. He was beloved by peasants in the fields. He was a man of many identities. He was a trickster, a soldier, a rebel, a lord. His name was Robin Hood. Since emerging in the 14th century, Robin has become one of the world's most famous and enduring legends. Today, his story seems familiar to us all. Robin lives in the woods with his merry men. He challenges the wrongful authority of the Sheriff of Nottingham, and he robs from the rich to give to the poor. Yet this familiarity disguises the evolution of this legend. For as society has changed down the centuries, so has Robin Hood. But what defines wrongful authority? What principles justify rebellion against it? Our answers are always shifting. In the earliest ballads and plays about him, Robin is no knight fallen on hard times, nor a nobleman denied his birthright. Instead, he is a man of the people, a yeoman, a little more than a peasant. The Robin Hood story is very much a story of ordinary people against authority. And Robin Hood is the nexus that allows authority to be challenged. He's saying something about the ordinary person, the ordinary yeoman bowman, having capabilities that aren't well understood by toffs. Robin Hood is smarter and better at shooting and better at defending himself than the people who think they're very smart because they've got account books and because they're good with abacuses. And that, in a way, is the point of him. That's what he's for. Stories about Robin were spread by word of mouth among ordinary people. 
and it was a time when they could do with a hero. The Black Death and other plagues had ravaged 14th century England. Civil war followed. Millions were killed or displaced. The stories of the defiant and clever Robin Hood offered rare victories for the common man. But he would not be theirs alone for long. In 1510, King Henry VIII himself played the outlaw at a court pageant. Even the high and mighty could not resist Robin's appeal. In the 16th century, England became a Protestant nation. As the country changed, so did the stories of Robin Hood. Soon it was not only the Sheriff of Nottingham he fought, but corrupt Catholic priests as well. Under Elizabeth I, however, authorities grew concerned. This legendary man of the people was becoming too popular. Robin Hood, they decided, was a threat to their power. Efforts were made to suppress the stories. If Robin Hood was to survive, he would have to change yet again. His savior was Elizabethan playwright Anthony Munday. He transformed the outlaw from a yeoman into the Earl of Huntingdon, a fallen member of the aristocracy. This changed the target of Robin Hood's rebellion. In Munday's telling, the outlaw's conflict was only with corrupt authority. Now, a member of the aristocracy himself and a loyal servant of the true king, Robin became a representative of legitimate authority. And every time he defied the rulers of his fictional world, he reinforced the social structures of the Elizabethan. The next great shift came in the 19th century. The 19th century gets really keen on the medieval past. It's called medievalism. And this takes lots of different forms, like William Morris goes around trying to replicate medieval interiors and the look of medieval books, for example. You've got Tennyson writing poems about King Arthur, Idols of the King and the Maud Arthur. And Robin Hood's sort of part of that. People like Walter Scott rewrite the legend to bring it into line with the 19th century's idea of what the Middle Ages were. Robin becomes a literary figure, a popular figure. And once that happens, you get this romantic Robin Hood who is very much loved by all. He's loved by women, he's very, very charming. He's loved by good men. He's a true monarchist, which is very important in the expanding English empire. It was a time of urbanization, industry, and empire building. Its Robin Hood stories mingled nostalgia for a simpler medieval age with a muscular Victorian nationalism. The 19th century saw the popularity of the Robin Hood legend spread far beyond England. And in the 20th century, he would reach Hollywood. Since his early appearances in silent film, there have been dozens of screen adventures for Robin Hood. These depictions vary decade by decade, but they always question pressing issues of the day. In the 1920s, it was American isolationism. In the 30s, the Depression and Roosevelt's New Deal. In the 1950s, Britain's post-war reconstruction was the unspoken backdrop. In the 1970s, its tired decline. The 90s saw a new, more international Robin Hood with allies of different races and creeds. And we continue year after year to revisit the story and recraft it for our own age. For the appeal of Robin Hood seems undimmed by time. There's something immensely attractive about being an outlaw in connection with trees. I think it's just the idea of living in a world where you don't have to work, but where you have all kinds of important skills and you're living in this kind of almost Edenic nature. We like bad boys, and I think this is what the Robin Hood legend sort of attracts us to, in that he's a bad boy with a heart of gold. 
So there's something very, very attractive about him. His identity, his enemies, and the questions he asks of us continue to evolve with every new screen adventure. Robin Hood is both a figure of comforting permanent tradition and a relentlessly contemporary rule breaker. This dual identity is at the heart of his endurance. It is through constant evolution that Robin Hood maintains his foothold in our imagination. After weeks of wandering, the exhausted Roswell came to a city. Behind walls high and true stood great houses of stone, and beyond them, in the heart of the city, the towers of a mighty fortress dazzled in the sun. Roswell marveled at its wide streets and busy markets, but the greatest wonder was still to come. It was in the palace yard he saw her. He was transfixed. She was the most beautiful creature he had ever seen. Roswell summoned up his courage to speak with her. But before they had exchanged more than a few words, a harsh cry came from the palace. Princess Lillian, come at once. Your father wishes to speak with you. Reluctantly, the princess obeyed. Roswell stared longingly after her. She's not meant for the likes of us, lad, the passerby mocked. She's to marry some fine prince, I hear. Sure enough, just days later, the prince promised to Lillian arrived at the castle. Roswell joined the crowds at the gate, but when he saw the prince, he was stunned. It was none other than the treacherous steward who had stolen his fortune and his princely name. He was the man dear Lillian was to wed. Sudden reversals in fortune, like those of Paul Roswell, are difficult for individuals to bear. Whole societies can fare little better. Balancing people's competing demands is difficult at the best of times. A sudden shock can make it impossible. One such shock came in the 16th century. In 1517, German monk Martin Luther defied the teachings of the Catholic Church. He ignited a religious revolution. The Reformation had begun. Soon, Europe was divided as never before. Families, communities, and nations were split, Catholic and Protestant. Wars of religion scarred the continent, and the bloodiest of all was the Thirty Years' War. With almost eight million casualties, the conflict was one of the longest and most destructive in European history. It began in the Holy Roman Empire, a fragmented land of tiny kingdoms and principalities. All of these little kingdoms were caught up in a stupendous war about whether Catholics or Protestants should succeed to one of these little kingdoms. But all of them ended up getting involved, and it started in 1618, and it just banged on and on and on. This was the epoch of the war which proverbially laid waste to Germany. Germany was the theater of war for all of Europe. The pretty normal experience was for the other side to ride into your village and just kill everybody, and I really mean everybody. That kind of nightmare experience became quite commonplace and must have altered people's sense of the world. Caught up in this conflict was the North Bavarian town of Bamberg. It was a town built at the meeting of two rivers, 40 miles downstream from Nuremberg. It had grown in the shadow of a mountain fortress, but at its heart was the church. A four-towered cathedral loomed over the rooftops, and Catholicism 
dominated everyday life. Bamberg in the early 17th century was a typically South German, typically Bavarian place. It would have had a strongly established Roman Catholic culture. Bamberg was a prince archbishopric presided over by successive archbishops who strongly wanted to oppose the spread of Protestantism. It defined itself over against the newly established and threatening Protestant culture just a few leagues up the road. In 1623, Johann Georg von Dornheim became the city's prince bishop. Von Dornheim was a Jesuit. He was utterly committed to the Catholic Church and obsessed with pushing back Protestantism. The bishop was a rather extreme character, even by the standards of his day. He appears to have exploited his office as Prince Bishop of Bamberg to apply the most rigoristic uh, form uh, of witch hunting. Witch hunts were not new in Bamberg. They had taken place under several of von Dornheim's predecessors. But von Dornheim took the practice to extremes. Not for nothing was he dubbed the Hexenbrenner, the witch burner. Hundreds were accused, put on trial, and executed. In 1627, von Dornheim ordered the construction of the Witch House. This special prison had 28 cells and torture chambers. It was here he secured his confessions. There was quite lavish torture used to force a confession from witches. And we know this because one of the suspects actually smuggled the letter out to his daughter. It's incredibly sad, explaining what had been done to him, explaining why he'd had to name names and betray people, even though he knew what he was saying wasn't true. And it was the standard array of medieval tortures, thumb screws, the boots, and the strapado, which mostly rely not only on pain, but on creating disfigurement and disability. Neither age nor rank proved a defense against accusation. Among those executed were the mayor and his wife. Georg Hahn, a prominent doctor in the town, opposed the trials, but that only made him a target for the bishop. his wife, his son, and two daughters were all burned at the stake. Witches have featured in European mythology and folklore for thousands of years, but they were never confined to the safe world of the story. Many believed in sorcery and blamed it for misfortune in their everyday life. There has never been a society that didn't have at least a residual belief in witchcraft. It's not a recent thing. It doesn't suddenly bound into existence in the 17th century. What happens though, and this is important, in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, people started trying to prosecute everyone who they thought was guilty of witchcraft. And by the time of the Bamberg trials, it was a serious matter for the secular courts with capital punishment to follow. The theological and legal foundation for witch trials was found in a book published in the late 15th century, the Malleus Maleficarum, or Hammer of the Witches, defined witchcraft as a pact with the devil and laid down ways to combat this alleged evil. The prosecution of witches was not restricted to Germany, however. Similar trials took place throughout Europe. Both Protestant and Catholic communities took part. In a tiny village in Sweden, more than 70 people were beheaded in a single day. Hundreds were killed in Scotland. 
and the Spanish Inquisition accused thousands. A moral panic was gripping Europe. But what could drive whole societies to such inhuman acts? For hundreds of years in the Middle Ages, Europe benefited from long summers and mild winters. Crops were plentiful and the seas free of ice. But this medieval warm period did not last forever. By the 16th century, Europe had become colder. Rivers froze, snows lingered long into spring, and crops failed again and again. There was widespread famine. Months of rain ruined crops, and there were no charitable agencies, of course, to prevent people starving in their villages. What people thought they knew about the weather was constantly violated, and that upset them terribly and made them feel that something was causing all this. People are very reluctant to believe that nature is as changeable as it actually is. If your harvest fails for one year, but then another year, and then another year, these things appear to be against the course of nature. Because they appear to be unnatural, of course, it's natural for the collective mind to seek a supernatural reason for it. It's that kind of collective thinking which surely would have played a significant role in the collective fury of the witch hunts. The Bamberg trials finally ended after the Swedish intervention in the Thirty Years' War. King Gustavus Adolphus invaded Germany in defense of Protestantism. In February of 1632, his forces neared Bamberg. The Bishop von Dornheim fled. The remaining prisoners in the witch house were released. They were told never to speak of the torture inflicted upon them. The trials in Bamberg are a frightening example of what can happen when society turns on itself, when it seeks out the saboteurs and the enemies within, when it embarks on a witch hunt. In the 19th century, Britain was transformed. A steam-powered revolution was underway. Railways cut through the countryside. Chimneys pierced the sky. The roar of metal-toothed machinery filled the air, and black smoke veiled the heavens. The Industrial Revolution made Britain a global superpower. It reshaped the landscape of the country, and it altered the lives of its people forever. Although creating great wealth and beginning to improve living standards of even the poorest, this new age of industry was also disrupting established ways of life. Old jobs were disappearing, and towns were swallowing up people in their thousands. The cities were transformed by factories and mills. They became dark and dirty. People started doing what we would now think of as a really long work day, actually. They typically were roused by the factory siren at sort of seven in the morning and didn't stagger home again until six at night. When you get new communities, you really have to create myths and legends that allow people to deal with that environment and allow people to identify themselves with that environment. Once you've got people living in the rookeries, they're going to start trying to make up stories about where they are, and they're going to start trying to incorporate this nightmare landscape of thick smoke and fog and blackened buildings and hungry children into their mythology as a way of coping with it. 
There aren't the certainties of the old small communities where everybody knew everybody. So the Industrial Revolution was a great sort of upset to old communities, but it also created new communities. And it's the transition between the old and new communities where you get a lot of new legends and myths starting to emerge. The first rumors began circulating in the autumn of 1837. In the villages south of London, a monstrous fiend was on the loose described as a great white bull or bear. Something had attacked several people, and women were its favorite target. As the rumors spread closer to the heart of the city, the strange creature's form shifted. It became more human and all the more frightening. It was an unearthly visitant, clad in armor and long clawed gloves who struck at night before escaping with great leaps over the city rooftops. By early 1838, authorities could no longer ignore the phenomenon. On the 8th of January, Sir John Cowan, Lord Mayor of the City of London, publicized a letter he had received from a resident of South London. The letter warned of the strange apparition and the terror growing among the people. The Lord Mayor, however, was dismissive. These attacks were either made up or the work of malicious pranksters. The Times printed the Mayor's announcement the next day. The monster made another leap, this time into the imaginations of people around the country. He soon had a name as well. Spring-Heeled Jack. This is where you really see the media beginning to take the legend and feed back into the legend. Terrible event in somewhere, great outrage in, I mean, you know, the usual things. But you also had a lot of chapbooks, which are sort of little, almost like little paperbacks, little sort of paper books, which were sold by peddlers all over the country. It comes from the kind of literature that usually gets characterized as the penny dreadful, which is a literature deliberately produced for and to some extent also by the ordinary kids who are just about literate, who love a good story, who love to be scared. And the idea of something, something jumping at you is like a popcorn moment in a horror film, basically. And this is part of the thing that appealed to people. They like to be scared. spring -Hill Jack was a blend of the old and new. He was a figure reminiscent of ancient superstition, yet was strikingly modern in his appearance. Whether the attacks were real or fabricated in many ways doesn't matter. The fact that the story spread so quickly and were believed by so many reveals an anxiety at work in Victorian society. For with his metal claws and furnace mouth, spring -Hill Jack was the dark personification of this new industrial urban world. A new demon, hidden among the anonymous masses of the city. It must have seemed to people that they were living in hell. At night, you could see the fires from the potteries for miles and miles and the smoke belching out. Why would you not think that this was part of a kind of modern demonology. This notion of a character who can jump quickly, looks like the devil, sometimes he's skeletal, sometimes he's got fiery eyes, but he also begins to take on characters of the Gothic hero, in that he can be dressed as a gentleman and he has a long cloak. So you can see this figure being created about all of the fascinations and anxieties of the Victorian world. I suspect Spring Hill Jack struck people as a kind of emanation of the Industrial Revolution itself. The darkness, the terrible smog and fogs that overtook the country, the fact that even the trees turned black. He's the perfect urban legend for the Victorian era. He's a criminal, he's supernatural. You never know when he's going to appear. He attacks the vulnerable. But of course, if you read about him in a chapbook or a newspaper or see him on stage, somehow you're safe.
three days of jousting were announced to celebrate the nuptials of Princess Lillian. The crowd roared as the jousts began. But sitting in the royal box beside her husband-to-be, Lillian could not muster even a smile. Across the tourney field, the miserable Roswell paid little heed to the spectacle either. When the jousting came to an end, the victors paraded down the ground. The custom was for them to stop and bow at the royal box. But not this day. Instead, the three knights ignored the imposter prince and rode on towards the other side of the ground. There, among the common people, they found Roswell. It was to him they bowed. Roswell was stunned until the knights removed their helmets. They were the noblemen he had freed from his father's dungeon. They denounced the imposter in the royal box and proclaimed Roswell the true prince. Arrest them, the steward cried, but nobody moved. Arrest them! The more he shouted, the less princely he looked. Instead of the royal bride he hoped for, the steward received a traitor's death. His head was left to rot above the city gates. Reclaiming his royal title, Roswell married Lillian. The happy kingdom they inherited lived in peace and justice all the rest of their days. With roots in earlier folklore, the story of Roswell was a popular one in 16th century England and Scotland. It was a tale of social order uprooted and then restored. An attractive proposition for many in what was a time of religious upheaval and national uncertainty. For change is often frightening. Too much can tear society apart, but too little and society withers. In times of change, stories can be a comfort to cling to or a tool to probe with. They can be a reminder of shared history or a vision of a possible future. The best of them have lingered in our memory for centuries. The tensions in society reflected by those tales have not disappeared completely, however. We remain a jumble of contradictions just about muddling by. But as was ever the case, is in the stories we cherish, in the legends we believe, and in the myths we retell, that those contradictions are debated and our values are tested. The tales have been told since man first gathered around the fires of prehistory. Tales of the strange and wondrous things hidden in the vast unknown shadows of the world. Tales of creatures divine and beasts demonic, of gods and kings, of myths and monsters. From dark forests to the lands of ice, from desert wastes to the storm-thrashed seas, every corner of the earth has its legends to tell. Stories of heroes and the villains they encounter. Of the wilderness and the dangers within. Stories of battles, of love, of order, and of chaos. But what are the roots of these fantastic tales? And why have they endured so long? In this series, we'll explore the history behind these legends and reveal the hidden influences that shaped them. War and disease, religious and social upheaval, the untamable ferocity of the natural world, and above all, the monsters lurking within ourselves.
things come to an end. Mighty trees wither. Monuments crumble. And even the brightest star in the night sky will one day lose its luster. We too must face our mortality. Universal though death is, every culture varies in the rituals and beliefs that surround it. How death is dealt with tells us far more about the living than it does about the dead. What a culture thinks death is, is in many ways less a statement about death than a picture of the inside of a collective mind. We tend to imagine the moment of death as a moment of summation, a moment that clearly tells us what we've been. It can tell us about what is considered a good death and a bad death, and what that then tells us about broader social values. A culture's beliefs about death reflected their attitudes towards life, in their hopes for the hereafter, in their stories of resurrection and their visions of the end of the world, societies revealed what is most important to them. an age of the axe and the sword, of the wind and the wolf. The kingdoms of the earth had fallen into chaos. Survivors sought what shelter they could find. For a mother and her child, the shattered remnants of an abandoned village offered comfort in these times. But starvation and despair had made monsters of men. The whole world groaned beneath them. A storm, the likes of which you'd never seen, scorched the sky. Ragnarok was upon them, the twilight of the gods. Death is a test of what being human means. It probes our responsibilities to family and the community, and it asks what value we place on our links to the past. The afterlife in Norse mythology was not a single place. The best and bravest went to Valhalla, but most were not so lucky. A darker place awaited them. Through a sunless valley they had to walk, along a path carved deep by the dead. There lay a land draped in fog, glimmering with misery. Even the most beloved of gods was one day trapped there. Baldur was the son of the gods Odin and Frigg. He was fair and wise and admired by all. Baldur is one of the most interesting gods in the Norse pantheon. He is beautiful, he is literally shining. He is, in a sense, the best of the gods. 
As a result, like all people who are loved and admired and who seem intrinsically good, he's kind of doomed. There's a prophecy that he's going to die. Balder dreamt of his death. So did his mother, the goddess Frigg. So she traveled all around the cosmos, extracting a promise not to hurt Balder from every pebble, plant, bird, and beast. But she had made a mistake in her oath gathering. There's one thing she had missed. She doesn't ask the mistletoe. Now, we're not sure why the mistletoe was excluded. It was clearly a sacred plant of some kind, possibly because it winds around something else. It said it, that this was a very weak plant, so she didn't bother asking it. For whatever reason, there's this one seemingly harmless thing in the entire world which does not promise that it will not injure Baldir. Meanwhile, the gods had invented a new pastime, using Baldur for target practice. They hurled rocks at him, trees at him, and anything else they could find. No matter how mighty the throw or how sharp the missile, Baldur was unharmed. But one god knew more than the others. Loki, the mischief maker, had heard of Frigg's mistake with the mistletoe. He thought of a better game. Loki is determined to bring about the death, and so he coaxes the mistletoe into growing bigger and bigger, and then eventually crafts it into a dart, which he hands to Baldur's blind brother, Hod. Hod threw this missile at his brother, but instead of bouncing off, the dart of mistletoe pierced Baldur's heart. The horrified gods could only watch as the best and most beloved of them fell down dead. This version of Baldur's death was not of the Viking era. It was among the stories compiled at least a century later by an Icelandic poet named Snorri Sturluson. He was a poet, he was a lawyer, he was a politician, he was a historian. And he wrote down many of the Norse myths. Now, what's interesting, the way Snorri writes them, he kind of writes them as a complete narrative. He kind of makes all of the bits match up with one another. So you can sort of see him selecting bits, probably making up a few bits as well, so that you get this whole history, this whole coherent history of the Norse gods, rather than fragmented myths and rather than sort of variants of fragmented myth, which is actually the normal way that you would find mythology. Earlier versions of the tragedy depicted Balder as an aggressive warrior. But in Snorri's telling, he is mild and joyful. It's only the treachery of the wicked that leads to his death. It's one of those stories where many critics have suggested that we can detect the influence of Christianity. The whole of the Eddas were written by Christian people, and that's one of the tales that most scholars believe is influenced by Christianity. Snorri is not Christianizing things in the sense that he's kind of repressing paganism. It's much more that he's harmonizing the stories. Balder is beautiful and he's good, and yet he's doomed to die and he does die, but he's also resurrected. So it does have a Christological feel to it. It's a myth which I think also allows you to see how cultures are able to bridge a pagan world and a Christian world in a very creative sort of way. In Snorri's telling, a near Christian perception of good and evil was introduced to the old tale. Loki is wicked and devil-like. Baldur is guiltless, near perfect. Even the most perfect of us cannot cheat death, however. Like the Norse gods and their games, we may amuse ourselves to forget, but there's no getting away from reality. Death is inescapable. But as the myths and countless traditions tell us, it may not be the end. The 
The enemy were on the march. Monsters and demons. Giants and world wreckers. They were coming for the gods. Odin, chief among the gods, sought no counsel but his own. Long had he awaited this day. The gods gathered in their feasting hall. The rafters shook to rumor and discord. The world tree had shuddered. The gallowhorn had sounded. Their doom had come at last. We will not shrink from this battle. Odin silenced them all. We will face them. We will fight. We will fight together one last time. The gates of Valhalla, sealed so long, swung open. The mighty warriors of ages past marched forth to war. An eternity had they readied themselves for this. The final battle was about to begin. Valhalla was Odin's domain. The majestic hall, thatched in golden shields, was home to the bravest of Norse warriors who fell in battle. No such paradise was in prospect for the warriors of ancient Greece, however. Great heroes and lowly servants alike descended into the vast darkness of the underworld. A river stood before them there. Only those who'd been properly buried with a coin beneath their tongue could pay the ferryman to take them across. Nowhere is the question of proper burial more pressing or the consequences of getting it wrong more tragic than in the story of Antigone. Two brothers had fought for the crown of Thebes. Polynices had raised an army to unseat his brother Eteocles. In the mighty battle that followed, each had fallen to the other's sword. Their mourning sister Antigone was left to bury their bodies. But a new king had taken the throne. Creon was his name. He decreed that traitors should not receive burial. He refused Antigone permission to bury Polynices. Defying the laws of the gods, he ordered that the rebel be left to rot on the battlefield. Burial was insanely important to the ancient Greeks. The essential Greek idea of what happens to the dead meant that unless you were properly buried and properly mourned, you couldn't make the transition from life into death and instead were kind of trapped between life and death in a miserable, dissatisfied state. The ritual itself took three stages. There was the preparing of the body, the carrying out of the body, the procession of the body, and then the actual internment or the cremation. You had to do the ritual right to mean they could go and be at peace in the underworld, as it were. Because it's so important, it therefore follows that for someone to be unburied struck the Greeks as horrific. All societies have rituals surrounding burial. They convey the dead from this world to the next. But they serve a function for the living as well. Funerals tell an individual's life story from the perspective of the community. It emphasizes what the community sees as being valuable in the individual's life. By having a funeral, it's a way of saying, well, our society, the group to which I belong, will continue. It's also a ceremony in which the dead are sort of escorted to whatever is going to happen to them after they die, and are, in a sense, made to stay there. They're ritually a really important moment for passing the dead person into whatever happens next, and then allowing the family of the dead person to come back out of a phase of being polluted by association with a dead body, being reintegrated into society. In 6th century Athens, the rich and powerful commemorated themselves with grand monuments. By the following century, however, fashions had shifted. More modest grave markers were the norm. 
something had changed. But what? In the 440s, Athens was beginning to empire build. It had been at the head of the Delian League, which had been a group of Greek cities gathered together to throw off the Persians, stop them invading Greece, that had kept banded together, but was becoming less and less a group of cooperative people and more and more an empire by proxy with Athens at the head. The Athenians come into money. They decide to spend it on huge cultural projects. That's why they build the Parthenon, so that everyone sees Athens as the most beautiful city they've ever seen. But if Athens could flaunt those new riches, its citizens had to be more restrained. Few individuals dared build more than the most modest of tombs. They were eclipsed by the thrusting imperial state. If you die on the battlefield, we start to see a way in which, rather than individual burial, people are brought back to Athens, they are separated into their tribes, and you are put into a tribal tomb. It foregrounds the way in which epitaphs and what gets written on your grave become more and more of a public matter and a moment in which the public contribution of an individual is stressed, which seeks to incorporate the military dead into the life of the city itself, saying that the city exists because of them and therefore owns them, owns their lives and the sacrifice that they've made. They no longer belong to themselves or to their families. They now belong to Athens. Antigone, too, was caught between the needs of the nation and those of the individual. She could obey Creon's edict and leave her brother to the scavenging birds, or follow the law of the gods, bury Polynices, and free his soul to enter the underworld. She chose to defy the king. It was just a sprinkling of soil, but that was all that was needed to satisfy the gods. Creon was furious. How dare this girl defy him? She had to be punished. So the king ordered Antigone to be entombed alive, sealed up in a mountain cave. The rule of law, Creon so prized, would come with a mighty cost, however. First, his heir, Antigone's fiance, killed himself from grief. Then his wife, took her own life as well. Although written almost two and a half thousand years ago, the tragedy of Antigone exposes tensions in society that we debate to this very day. The words of Athenian playwright Sophocles speak to us still. Antigone captures a really compelling moral tension about whether what Antigone did in defying Creon's order was right. The reason that carries on being so compelling is the battleground of what right is keeps on shifting. For the ancient Greeks, it was sort of very much about respect for the gods, about piety, and Antigone saying, well, your rule, your law, does not override the law of the gods. At what point do you have to act? When must you do something in complete defiance of the law? When does it actually override everything, including your own self-preservation instinct? So the question of was Antigone right is one that every generation and every society comes to with its own sense about what right does and doesn't look like. Ancient Greeks did not believe death was the end. Their souls would wander the sad fields of the underworld for eternity. This seemingly dismal fate offered one comfort at least to those left behind. They had little reason to fear the dead. The spirits of ancient Greece could be irritable if dishonored. They could be unpleasant, but they were not dangerous. That was not a belief shared by all cultures. Centuries later, Europe would be stalked 
by fears of unhappy spirits seeking revenge and of the undead who feasted on blood and flesh. The sky was rent asunder. The great battle of the gods had begun. The dread wolf, Fenrir, that beast of slaughter, strained to join the fight. Odin stood fast with his dwarf-forged spear and helm of shining gold. The Midgard serpent, immense and writhing, dripped venom foul and deadly. Facing him was mighty Thor, brave warder of the earth. He summoned up his strength and all the power of his hammer. More lethal still was the fire giant Surtur with his body of riven flame. It was Freyr the Bright and his boar steed, Golden Mane, who joined battle with this demon. The earth convulsed as the fighting raged. In the cataclysmic events of Ragnarok, it is giant snakes and wolves that run amok. Yet perhaps more frightening and more fascinating are the monsters closer to humans, the ones that walk amongst us, the ones who look like us, the ones who were us. the river-streaked plains of Serbia. Once a borderland between east and west, its soil was little troubled by the plow. Few hunters roamed its trackless forest, and the strongest trade between its few villages was rumor and superstition. In 1725, the tiny hamlet of Kilisova became the talk of Europe, for nine people had died within a week, with no sign of sickness and no sign of plague. It seemed impossible. In fearful whispers, the rumors spread. A night walker was stalking the village. It throttled men in their sleep, some said. But others insisted on a different explanation. The night walker, they said, ate human flesh and drained its victims of their blood. Tales of demons who consume the flesh and blood of the living are nothing new. They've been found throughout history in nearly every culture around the globe. The belief in the undead coming back to nourish themselves in some parasitical, inimical way on the bodies of the living uh, is very widespread in human cultural history. One of the consistent things about societies is that once the dead are dead, we really want them to stay dead. There is an almost universal fear that if the dead return, they will somehow damage the living. As soon as an imperial official from Vienna had arrived in the village as witness, they began digging. For just before the night walker had claimed its first victim, an old man had died in Kilisova. This was the grave the villagers opened. What was found within stunned the imperial official. The old man's body was pink and fat. His hair and fingernails had grown and his mouth was wet with the blood of his victims. A medical person would say, oh, no, no, hang on. This is natural decomposition. This is the gases in the corpse. This is the pooling of blood. This is the fact that hair and nails don't really grow afterward. It's that the corpse is shrinking. This can be explained. It's medicine. It's perfectly natural. Well, that's fine, but it isn't necessarily going to address the anxieties and the fears. The villagers of Kilisova removed the old man from his grave. They drove a metal stake through his heart and burned the body on a fire. 
for the villagers were convinced the old man was a vampire. The folklore vampire is essentially a revenant, a dead person coming back. They're wrapped in their shrouds, often they're bloated, slavering, and they cause death more by contagion. They're not bloodsuckers to, to start with. Of course, it is fascinating that a third category arises between the world of the living and the world of the dead. It's inexplicable and it's possibly threatening, possibly liberating. The story of the Kilisova vampire soon made the newspapers in Vienna and far beyond. A vampire panic was spreading across Europe. Inevitably, it left its mark on wider culture. In 1816, a group of authors and poets held a ghost story competition. Famously, it led to Mary Shelley's novel, Frankenstein. Another contribution came from Lord Byron. He started a novel about the foul feeders of Eastern legend. He never finished it, but his friend, John Polidori, was inspired. He wrote a short story based on it. He called it The Vampire. These are writers who are products of the Enlightenment. They're not a religious persons but they are persons who no longer believe in the Christian story. They are therefore looking for alternate stories to tell about the world of death. The vampire, of course, offers that crossover figure. The vampire story in the 19th century develops in a very different way from the folklore vampire. You get this very, very popular figure of this elegant night walker, this handsome man in evening clothes who is, you know, death to anyone around him. And you get these extremely attractive, very, very dangerous men, and then slightly later women as well, who represent both a sexual threat as well as a sexual attraction. No vampire is more alluring or dangerous than the one created by Bram Stoker in 1897. His creation, an ancient nobleman called Dracula, comes from the East to infiltrate Victorian Britain. Dracula, who wants nothing more than to dress up in English clothes and to come to London with its teeming millions, is in fact a story of reverse colonialization. Instead of Great Britain colonizing Eastern nations, we have a representative of an Eastern nation who is about to colonize Great Britain. He's an outsider. He's an element of pollution. He's an element of destruction, who is both attractive and repulsive at the same time. Stoker himself was an Irishman. I mean, he knew what exclusion and conflict was like. So suddenly the vampire story, in terms of a literary story, has emerged into something where you can really, really critique the world. It seems to me that the issues in Stoker's Dracula are issues which are still anything but resolved in today's culture. And I think that's why we keep coming back to them. More recent entries in the genre have seen vampires terrorize the suburbs of Stockholm, the post-apocalyptic wilds of Los Angeles, and most frighteningly of all, American high schools. Our fascination with vampires, it seems, is as endless as the demon's own thirst for blood. battle was over. One by one, the greatest of gods had fallen. Odin, Thor, Freya, and all the warriors of Valhalla with them. It was the end of the gods. And it was the end of the world.
It's no surprise the story ends in this way. Floods are one of the most common motifs in mythology. The best known, of course, is the story of Noah in the Bible. Displeased with the corruption and violence he saw on earth, God decided to start afresh. He flooded the earth, allowing only Noah and his family to survive alongside remnants of all the animals. A similar story is found in Assyrian texts dating back to 2000 BC, in ancient Egyptian tomb inscriptions, and in ancient Greek mythology. Phrygia was a harsh land, cold in the winters, hot in the summers, and arid all year round. From northern steppes to southern hills, the stony earth bore neither fruit tree nor olive. But among its coarse plains and exposed ridgetops, there was once a village. Its houses were fine, its citizens worthy. Two wandering peasants came to this village. They were in search of a warm welcome and a warm bed. But those fine houses and worthy citizens turned them away one after another. Finally, the two peasants reached the end of the village. Here they found a humble cottage thatched with stem and reed. It was home to an old couple named Balkis and Philemon. Poor though they were, they opened their doors to the strangers. The old woman coaxed the ashes of their fire back to life. They offered their guests the finest food and drink in the house and the most comfortable of their chairs. Balkis and Philemon were about to kill their one and only goose in honor of their guests when the strangers revealed the truth. They were gods, none other than Mercury and Jupiter himself, chief among the Roman deities. They promised the old couple a just reward for their hospitality. The fable of Baucis and Philemon was written by the Roman poet Ovid. He lived during the first century AD. It was a time of great change in Roman life when Augustus, the first emperor, was cementing his power. Ovid is writing in a period of increasing stability. It was a much more settled time for Roman society as a whole that was thinking about coming out of this period of great disturbance. One of Augustus's great claims about restoring the Republic was piety. He claims on his funerary monument that in just one year he restored 28 temples. So Bacchus and Philemon fits into that kind of narrative because you have this idea of piety being rewarded, of showing piety that other people aren't showing. The gods had promised the old couple a reward for their generosity. They had told Bacchus and Philemon to leave their cottage and accompany them to the heights of a nearby mountain. They heaved their aged bodies up the slope. But when they finally reached the summit, the gods told them to look back on their village. A flood had washed every home and street away, all except their tiny hut. That Jupiter had transformed into a magnificent temple. Their whole village has been overrun by a flood. Um, the whole world has been drowned but they've been saved and they're on a mountainside. This was the punishment for not giving hospitality to strangers that was due. It just illustrates the insane importance, which you sometimes can get in the Mediterranean world, of being decent to strangers. You have to invite them in, and if you invite them in, you have to feed them. As reward for their piety, Jupiter granted Balkis and Philemon a wish Anything they desired would be theirs. But the elderly couple had a simple request. They asked to be the keepers of that fine temple, to share 
every day with the other and never be separated, even in the moment of death. After years of service to the gods, the day fated for their deaths came. As Balkis and Philemon died, they were transformed. They became trees of oak and linden. Entwined in root and leaf, they grew together for years to come. From destruction, the story tells us, there is creation. From death, there is new life. The gods were gone, consumed by Ragnarok. Water shrouded the earth, a vast ocean, still, silent and unchanging. But all things come to an end. Life returned to the earth. So the cycle of life begins again. And with new life, there come new stories. For human beings have always been storytellers. In the myths and legends we remember, and those we choose to pass on, we are links in a chain, stretching back millennia. Part of an eternal dialogue between our past, our present, and our future. The fact that a myth might be completely incomprehensible, completely nonsensical on a rational level doesn't matter because it can still tell us about what our society is like and what our culture is like. A myth tells us what we believe to be the case. It also offers us, in those terms, means of resolving ethical, social, cultural conflicts. If one thinks of it as a narrative, a way of encapsulating the things that are important in society, and not always the positive things, they are really telling us about the dynamics in the society in which they're told. I think it's very important that people sort of go on probing things with myth. An awful lot of our lives and our decisions are actually not about reason and not about planning. They're about emotions. Mythology is a guide to that. It's a way of understanding the way we feel, not the way we think. Many myths can seem bizarre or cruel to modern eyes. Yet for all mythology's variety and infinite strangeness, there is a common thread that links us to even the most ancient of stories. Whether it was on the streets of Athens or the frozen seas of the north, the dark woods of England or the distant mountains of the east, the same thoughts have been uttered in a thousand tongues. Who are we? Where have we come from? Why is the world the way it is? And what will we find beyond? They are questions that define human existence, no matter when or where it is found.